And today, um, my friends from uh, Mother Culture, um, Beran, Azra, and I, uh, we will uh, conduct an uh, interview with Simon Blackbar on uh, behalf of the Mother Culture. Uh, we are so happy today to have you here. It's such a great honor for us to make us with you. So if, it's, if you are ready, we would like to start with our question. Yes, fine. Okay. Okay. So what does it all mean? What is the meaning of life, existence and death? <coughs> I don't think they mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it, I, I must qualify that. Um, I don't think that it's possible to see a purpose mm -hmm. lying outside the things that we are familiar with. Now, there are lots of things that give life meaning. Um, I don't know whether any of you young women are, are mothers, but if you're a mother, you know that your child's smile means everything to you. Um, if you're academics, you know that success in your examinations on your writings or, or your reputation they mean things to you and if you're a doctor you trying to find the cure for covid then um being able to vaccinate people would mean success and that would mean lots to you so you find meaning in individual uh, aspects of life in activities in achievements in friends in babies and children and so on but then if you put all that together and say, yes, but what does it all mean? Then I don't think there's an answer. Um, it, as we all know, it's all going to end. It'll end in death. And as far as each of us is concerned, that is going to be the end of it. But of course, we can have hopes for the world after our death. Um, I hope that my books will go on being read. Um, I'd be very disappointed if some uh, somebody from the future came back and said, no, I'm afraid your books will all be absolutely forgotten. <laughs> it's quite possible, but I prefer not to know about it. Um, so that's my view about meaning, that it's, um, in a sense, it's piecemeal. It's, it comes one thing at a time. But to ask about the meaning of the whole thing, no. So thank you for your reply. And uh, my next question is, what do you think about human nature? And regarding your position about human nature, is there such a thing as ideal society? Right. Um, well, I think, the, I think there's a lot of things in human nature that stand in the way of an ideal society, because I don't think we're such nice animals as we like to think. Um, I don't think that we are as safe in um, our societies as we like to think. Some societies are safer than others, but in every society there's the possibility of obviously crime, possibility of um, uh, government infringement of liberties, possibility of economic collapse. Um, so we're all all, always in a sense, work, walking on a tightrope. And I think it's important for people to realize that because otherwise we become complacent and think things will always go on as they have gone on. And that's not true. Uh, they can change and often they don't change for the better. Oh, well, I'll, thanks for your answer too. Uh, I'll be asking, asking the next question. Um, we want to know, uh, regarding to you, how does our functional work between body and mind? Why is the body and mind relation still a problem for humanity? Right. Well, of course, keep taking care of our bodies is, as, as is it were, a, a given. We've got to eat. We've got to sleep. Um, we have to keep ourselves clean and healthy as far as possible. So taking care of our bodies is straightforward. Taking care of our minds is rather harder. Um, you have to cultivate your mind. Um, a good mind is not usually uh, just something that's given you at birth. That's why we need schools, we need education, we need traditions. We need to study great writers, great musicians, great poets, great philosophers. And that way you 
hopefully your mind improves. Um, some people's don't improve, <laughs> but, but I'm sure all you three um, have benefited from such education. And um, when, when you have it, you've, it, it's something you would never be without. Um, that is, uh, John Stuart Mill, famous philosopher, um, said that uh, better Socrates dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Um, and I think what he meant by that was, if you've got the choice of a Socratic life, a life of wisdom and of understanding and education and knowledge, you, you couldn't lose it without feeling a terrible sense of loss. You'd feel something had gone. Whereas if, um, you know, you like, I don't know, um, drinking or eating various foods, um, but then suddenly you can't do it anymore. Well, you know, okay, you shrug your shoulders and you carry on. You, if you can't get pomegranates, you learn to live without pomegranates. If you can't get um, wine, then you have to learn to live without wine. Which, speaking for myself would be a terrible problem, but it wouldn't be the same as somebody telling me that the wicked witch is going to come and take away my understanding of the world or take away my education. That would be something, that would be tragedy. So, Professor, we, you talk about body and mind. So, where can we place the soul between the body and mind? Is there any place? To... No, I don't think there's a place. I think, the, um, I think we, we get very confused by the noun, mind. Mm -hmm. uh, because as soon as you've got a mind, it sounds as though you're referring to a thing. And as soon as you've got a noun, it sounds as though you're referring to a thing, and then you ask, well, where is this thing? Um, Descartes famously um, located it at one point in the brain, um, but not for very good reasons. Um, I think the noun lets us down. What you should think in terms of instead is mentality, having a mind or having a mental capacity. And then those capacities make up your mental abilities, your mental um, uh, ways of dealing with the world. Um, and they're skills. Um, and nobody asks, where's your skill? You know, if you're a good runner, um, well, you're a good runner. Where's the skill? Uh, it's in the way you run. It's not in a place. It doesn't have a location. So I think uh, having a mind is like that. Thank you. So I would like to ask you another question about free will and the liberty. And is there any convenient atmosphere that we can freely speak and behave? Or is it kind of a reflection or illusion that they, that they want us to believe? Um, could I just repeat the question and see if I've got it right? You asked if, if if, if free will is an illusion that somebody's got you to believe yeah. as, opposed, as opposed to whether it's real. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, this is a very complicated, as you know, a lot of philosophers have spent a lot of time and ink and paper uh, writing about this. So I'll only sketch an answer. Um, I think that there are things that I can, um, I've got control over. Um, for example, I've got no control over the um, amount of hair I have. Um, none of us do. We just grow whatever. I mean, hair grows. You can't do anything about it. At least most people can't. Um, maybe one day you'll be, there'll be tonics which enable your hair to grow more or less. But at present, as far as I know, there aren't any. Um, but there are other things where I do have control. I can control how much I eat. I can control, um, you know, whether I go for a walk every day. I can control um, all sorts of things. Um, and that means that I'm um, what some philosophers call reason responsive. Um, that is, there are considerations you can advance which will influence me for or against uh, for example, going for a walk every day. 
you might say, oh, doctors have discovered it doesn't do, you, do your health any good. Or, and then I'd start thinking, well, do I really need to go for a walk every day? I want to go for a walk every day. So I'd be, I'd be responsive to reasons in the case. Now, when people are doing things which are or should be responsive to reasons, and they behave badly, that's when we hold people responsible. Um, so take a contrast. Um, suppose you're, uh, are you based in Istanbul, may I ask? Uh, we are all from the different part of Turkey, but mostly in Istanbul. Mostly in Istanbul. In that case, you, uh, you travel on the trams a lot, I expect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, okay, so supposing you're on a tram and you're standing, and it's crowded, mm -hmm. and suddenly somebody stamp, uh, stamps on your foot. Mm. It's, and he immediately says, I'm terribly sorry, um, you know, I, I, I lost my balance, terrible. And you say, oh, that, that's, that's all right, that's all right, you know. Um, on the other hand, suppose you've got reason to suppose that he did it deliberately. Um, it was a kind of attack. Mm -hmm. Well, attacking people is the kind of thing which is reason responsive. Um, you'd need a motive to do it. Mm -hmm. um, you, if you did it just arbitrarily, you'd be regarded as a kind of... Um, you know, social nuisance as an outcast of some sort. Um, because we expect people to think about whether to, you know, attack other people on public transport, um, and preferably to decide not to do it. Um, and so if this person has transgressed against that, then you hold, hold them to blame, you hold them responsible. And emotionally, you have a very different kind of reaction. Mm -hmm. If somebody stand, stood on your foot accidentally and they apologize, you say, okay, that's fine. You know, um, but if they did it deliberately, you know, if you might want to call the police or, or get very worried. What's, what, what's this chap thinking? What's going on? And so emotionally, we have very different reactions in the case of a deliberate transition, trans, trans, transgression and an accidental one. And that distinction, I think, will never go away. That's part of human life. Um, so whatever we think about free will in the abstract, we're going to make a distinction between behaviors which were within our control and things which were not, because, for example, accident or loss of balance or something like that got in the way. It's a tricky distinction, and of course there are lots of cases where we mightn't really know which side of the line um, some behavior falls. Um, there are people who are negligent, who are careless of other people. Well, is their behavior accidental or is it deliberate? You, you might be worried about that. But in principle, there's a distinction there, and I think it's a distinction we all, uh, all, all fundamentally recognize. Um, so that's, that's when we start talking about responsibility and free will. Um, there's a very fine article by a great philosopher from Oxford called Peter Strawson, um, called Freedom and Resentment. Mm -hmm. And he, he located the issue about free will in this business about feeling resentment. If you feel resentment at somebody's treatment of you, you're in effect saying they're responsible. It's their fault, it's that they're responsible. Um, and that's when we talk about um, free will. So, Professor, uh, in your work, uh, which is named the uh, Big Question, uh, Big Question Philosophy, you say that, that if our best efforts come to nothing, nothing often enough, uh, we need consolation and thoughts of uh, unfolding infinite destiny or karma are sometimes consoling. Uh, if our best efforts do not come to do nothing, uh, then what is the best way uh, of acting for human beings in terms of free will? Hmm. I think the context of that remark of mine, I was talking about fatalism. Mm -hmm. um, fatalism where you just, as it were, say there's nothing I can do about it. I'm 
you know, I've just got to put up with it. Um, now, of course, I, fatalism is very, I think, much more common when people are feeling powerless in society, when people feel that no matter what they do, they're going to be poor. Or no matter what they do, they do, they're going to be um, treated as second-class citizens. Or no matter what they do, they're going to something or another. So when you feel powerless, you, you look for a sort of consolation. Mm -hmm. The consolation would be um, it's in God's hands, or it's the working of karma, it's the working of fate. Um, it can't be helped. We mustn't fret about it. It's a way of saying, don't let it worry you. Um, and um, people sometimes take, as I say, some sort of consolation in that. But of course, very often, it's something that you want to worry about. I mean, I should imagine all you um, women are concerned about the status of women in Islam or in Turkey or in um, the Middle East in general. And if somebody comes along and says, oh, you know, it's just fate, just don't worry about it. You, you're very likely to say, no, it's not. This is something we can do something about. We can write, we can protest, we can try and change people's minds, we can, and so on. So very often the, an encouragement of fatalism is a way of discouragement from activism. But sometimes we need activity, we need to do something about things. And um, it's only if you try and do something about things and fail and fail and fail and nothing happens that you might start to say, I can't do anything about this. And then you take up a fatalistic attitude.